it's uh, Chuck of Conroy. Welcome back to more Splatoon 2. Last time we opened the way to the boss cat. That is not how I jumped, game. That is not how I jumped. Not fair. Nope, nope, not gonna, not gonna take that one. Eh, whatever, what am I doing? I can just do this and go over there. Uh, this time we are going to, uh, make our way over there somehow. Pull out the hero charger, hit that. And is this, is this a Sheldon's request? Do I gotta do this? Yeah. The boss kettle says, lips for days. No, the Octo Stamp returns. Oh. Now what I wanna do is go in here and see what the Sheldon's request is. Wow, this is very atmospheric. Hero dualies. I could use the hero dualies. Or I could leave. Yeah, I know, no one talks to Sheldon like that and gets away with their lives. Unless they have good reason, which I do. I wanted to see what weapon that was going to be here and if it was one that I regularly use, because I got over 1500 power eggs and I tend to use the hero dualies a lot, so let's upgrade it. Not sure what was going on on my stick right there. This is a pro controller, not a Joy-Con. Can't upgrade it further, it's maxed out. And then we can just skip travel back because we've already done it. And away we go. I could really use some more data on this weapon. Could you use it for a bit? You bet, buddy, and not because I already knew it. Nope. Ain't lips I would ever want to touch for days. I'm back! The Octo Stamp! Oh. Wait, I know this guy. It's the Octo Stamp. Oh. Octo Stamp? Oh. Didn't Agent 3 take him down years ago? I guess he's back for more. You got this, Agent 4. Oh my god. They made the first boss of the first game the third boss in the second? Games are too easy now. Well, lucky for you, he's got some kind of gimmick to make him a bit more challenging. And I brought the sweet new coat, Neo Octostop. <laughs> Unthinkable. His armor is completely uninkable. Gotta hand it to those Octarians. I sure now do know how to go big. Splatting, oh, splatting attack dodge roll. Okay, just doing that, just shooting at us. We gotta hit, get his nosy. Dodge to the side when he tries to face stomp you. I got my bombs that I can use to get to the side. I can already ink up his sides in the meantime. Or sorry, uh, her, with those uh, sexy legs that it's wiggling back and forth. There you go, second hit. Ah, getting in your squats. I bet you're in great shape under all that with those little legs being able to lift that thing up. Uh, <laughs> I love that, and I bought the sweet coat. Oh no, oh, whoa. Uh, he just grew two, that dude just grew two more faces. <laughs> Turn around, please. Turn around, oh boy, uh, oh geez. Man, it keeps uh, getting me. Uh, throw that. Let's give myself some ink to swim to the sides here. Okay, what, what, what? Yeah, barely got away. Okay, so now you turn around. And I got ample time to shoot you this time. The sides are no good, dodge backwards. Gotcha, that's it, ink him up. One of my favorite songs. Going? Where are you going? I got plenty of ink to swim around in, and you're going to not destroy your sides to make this harder on me. Okay. There it is. Death by the splits. Tearing your tendons is no fun. Oh, wait. Oh, there's like a safe area out here. I didn't know that. Huh. It's kind of cool. I actually didn't know that this was here. Okay, no, it doesn't seem so. Uh, one of the things that I drew attention to uh, is that back in Splatoon 1, there was a lot of uh, weird, creepy sounds you'd hear after beating a boss if you waited around for just a few seconds uh, that I'm willing to bet a lot of people skipped. People were asking me if it was back here and I didn't actually know the answer to the question, but it's not. <laughs> 
that time is inflated because I had to answer viewer questions. That's not fair. Agent 4, I want to thank you again for all you've done so far. I think it's time I told you about my other purpose in asking for your help. When we met, I told you I was searching for the great Zapfish. But I'm afraid that's not the whole story. Oh, you're actually a mad scientist bent on world domination and now I have to kill you. Uh, you see, even more than the great Zapfish, I want to find my cousin Kel- Oh, uh, family love! Yeah, that's that's another uh, motivator that people have for uh, asking heroes to help. Uh, she vanished on the same day as the great Zapfish. Wait, you already knew? Phew, cool. So anyway, I'm Agent 2 of the new Squid Beaks Platoon, and Callie is Agent 1. Then there's Agent 3, who's currently out with our grandpa, Captain Cuttlefish. They won't be back for a while. I was supposed to be protecting Inkopolis while the Captain was away, but then Callie, the great Zapfish... Sorry, I didn't tell you sooner. Um, we'd be totally sunk without you, Agent 4. I know we'll find Callie if we keep looking. Think you can see this thing through? Lee... No. Leave now! Huh? Who's there? Uh, if you get in our way, Agent 4 will mess you up! <laughs> you will face the wrath of Tatsu's very reliable friends! Oh my god, I just referenced him in a positive way. Dodge roll in! That opens the way! Callie and the Great Zapfish are up somewhere ahead, Agent 4. This soon, I somehow doubt it. Uh, Took me like eight tries there. We can now open up this ink rail that'll take us back to, well, the starting area. I can probably leap over here and just do the same thing anyway. All right, well, no little topic for us to go over quite yet. So I think we're gonna head back to Inkopolis Square and while we're on our way, I'm gonna show you the weapon of the day. The big old two-inch brush back once again. Honor thy favorite ASM artist by painting them a happy little picture of their own demise. Octobrush is the middleweight uncle of the ink brush, classified by longer range, more damage, and higher ink consumption. Its range is also longer than it seems and is worth testing its limits. A swing maxes out at 40 damage for a pretty certain three hit splat. 20 is the minimum damage at eye level, and 10 is the minimum when the ink falls down below. The roll is 25 damage. Downside is a lower roll speed, slower swings, and lower mobility stats. While the speed is lower, it's still only second to the ink brush in speed, beating rollers and enabling getaways and speedy approaches when the situation is safe. Jumping repeatedly raises the range slightly. Your fingers are dying for a worthy cause. This is also a showy and noisy weapon due to its large attack, so be aware of that whenever trying to sneak up on enemies. Others will likely see it happening. The effective main power-up on Octobrush is a fatter trail of ink left behind the roll. I suppose it could be insurance to swim backwards through the trail, but if they shoot the trail ahead of time at all, it doesn't have any practical use and should not be stacked. Its sub-weapon is Autobomb! So it's a little weird having a sub that chases someone when the weapon is pretty small range. But that's only one way of thinking about it. My goal isn't to kill you, it's to get a foolproof answer to see if somebody's hiding there. With well-placed throws, it becomes much harder to be snuck up on and caught in unfavorable situations. It assures that you aren't in an awkward spot as long as you're checking for them. A stealth player could not ask for a better friend. You won't even need half a tank to splat a foe, so just keep your ink up, toss it to answer questions, and either attack or reload depending on how it looks. Unfortunately, an autobomb isn't going to work as a spacing tool due to how slow acting it is, so it isn't as versatile as weapons with the splat or suction bombs. It checks and is more locked into that purpose. It's special as Inkjet! This weapon hangs out close to the action, out of sight before making its plays, so it'll likely be near some place to hide the jump marker. This is its most lethal way of attacking, but this means being good with the Inkjet is practically a requirement to succeed with this weapon kit. Main and sub aren't too lethal most of the time. Between the short range, slow bomb, and this special, we've got a high skill requirement to play this weapon. It's not horrible, just difficult to reach its potential. 170 points is the charge for this one, making it one of the easiest ink jets to charge up in Inkopolis. I also want to give special attention to Ninja Squid, as different players move around more than others. You might like just being harder to notice and stack lots of swim speed up. Could be a good combination. 
Ho ho, the Octobrush Nouveau plays in the support role. I'm so sorry. Its sub weapon is Squid Beacon. This isn't that good. Probably one of the worst main sub combinations in the game. It wants to play it safe due to no ranged main or sub weapon, so it'll at least be in spots to lay down beacons and have it easy with placing them down because it doesn't have many other ways to contribute at any given moment. Even worse, the Octobrush's attacks eat up lots of ink, and so do Squid Beacons. It would be harder than most other beacon weapons to use the beacon as bait or as a shield while still getting enough swings in. Its special weapon is Tenta Missiles! Just... ah! Man, I'm being snooty nonstop on this one, I wonder why. The main weapon has a hard time getting in once it's revealed itself, and the beacon does nothing to create openings, so the missiles are the only tool it gets for ranged pressure. Add the short range of the main weapon into the equation, and using the tracking of the special to pick off your foes is rare. Due to the harsh limitations on what it can do at any given time, I would not recommend turfing for the sake of it and making yourself obvious. But that's kind of hard to do because the Tana Missiles are its only pressure from any distance, and it has to build that up. Speaking of that, charges 170 points, making it at least tied for the easiest Tana Missile to rack up in the game. Yay? There's little synergy here, and the pieces feel at odds with one another. This is a team comp dependent weapon, only helpful if the 7 special combination is needed to fill a void. Barring that, this weapon is poor in battles with random opponents and can hold back a team pretty badly depending on what the rest of the team has. Think about it. Squid beacons don't matter if a random teammate has them as well, and Tana Missiles without voice chat is far short of its potential. You're of no help in gaining map control. Out of every weapon in Splatoon 2, this one probably has it the worst with spawn camping, and it has no way to get out by itself. I genuinely think this weapon is a joke and is outclassed in every sense. If you ask me, a burst bomb Octobrush would have worked better if they wanted a support brush. I want to focus on special charge up for this weapon. It sounds silly for Tenta Missiles, but that's the only time that it ever gets a say in anything. Build it up at all costs. And last, it's the Kenza Octobrush. Its sub weapon is Suction Bomb. Octobrush don't outrange a lot of weapons, but when it does, this can cut off escapes for opponents. More importantly, it allows for a nice few second shutdown of long reaching weapons so the user can either get by or make them back up. The splash damage can enable a nice two hit kill from the brush, but it isn't too likely of a setup from a pretty slow killing weapon. With this thing being stealthy, it's helpful to place a suction bomb around corners or in spots not easily seen to pick off enemies that try to approach you. Due to the Octobrush being so showy and the long detonation time of the bomb, it can bait someone into taking an out of sight bomb. Its special weapon is a first! Yeah, even this far in. Ultra Stamp! Drop the hammer! This was the very final special weapon added into Splatoon 2 and is only held by five weapons. Due to this, barely any weapon classes or sub weapons are paired with it at all. This is a lockout of the main and sub weapons to become strictly a melee attacker for nine seconds. The giant hammer moves forward as it swings, like a train painting the ground in its path. Hold ZR rather than tap it to always get the fastest possible repeated swings. While the hammer is down, the user is impervious to attacks from the front, and when swinging repeatedly, this is a near-perfect shield that bullets will only rarely penetrate. Nope, not a good panic button. Swinging does 100 damage on direct hit and 40 on splash. The attack squishes and diffuses bombs with even the splash area. It's also good at object shredding and can pop a Rainmaker shield quickly, but is likely to damage itself due to how close it has to stand to keep outputting that damage. Swimming to reposition is allowed during the special, and with such a long duration, might be worth doing once the initial intended use is over. While in the air, a 360 swoosh that attacks above and below the user is possible. Few things in Splatoon can attack above or below, so it's situationally useful if a sniper doesn't see you right below them, or if you're in a map with grates. Alternatively, you are allowed to prematurely throw the special away by pressing R and tossing it. This has long range, does 120 on direct hit, and 30 to 60 on splash. This is a special with powerful attacks along with surprisingly good defense. But here come the downsides of picking it. Number one. The back is completely exposed and it's bad at turning around. In fact, it's bad at turning, period. 
The arc on turning is wide, and if you stop swinging, you're left wide open with no other attacking option. If it misses, they can just turn around and shoot you. Might be time to throw it before they get their bearings straight. That's sort of another downside. It's predictable because it either has to keep swinging or throw away the rest of its special usage. Use it to push forward in tight spaces or when the enemy team can't swim to the side easily. Moving quickly down an inkable ground is another good choice. The last is just how huge this beast is. No one's going to be surprised by it once it's pulled out. You become the center of attention and everyone's just waiting for you to mess up so they can shoot you. It can't just rush in at any time and expect to make it out alive. There's no shame in activating it just for the throw. The attack area is quite large. It comes out pretty quick and it can multi-kill when enemies are close together, but be aware of it. The effective special power-up on Ultra Stamp is slightly increased special duration. Nah. As a set of three, the Kenza avoids the pitfalls of the first two kits and is the only one focused on slaying rather than on support. Sure, the Ultra Stamp is a big predictable attention grabber, but it's less vulnerable than the Inkjet at least. Between the suction bomb and throwing the stamp, it's got some pretty good options at shutting down long-range weapons. Because the Octobrush needs to play it safe to slay, it's likely to be in position to use that Ultra Stamp from the get-go. Here's the part where I tell you about Special Charge, but... 4 out of 5 weapons to have the Ultra Stamp have 180 points, and the Octobrush is one of them. There isn't really competition in the way of Special Charge. Consider this weapon if you want that rare special. Get a big old two-inch brush and beat the devil out of him. In the league battle stage, we mean business. Go be Arena Rainman. Two new stages. Yo, Marina, do you think our fans would show up if we performed here? Maybe, but the platform in the middle is way too small for my gear. <laughs> Today, I am playing for the baseball team, the Japanese seances? Uh, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, uh, today I am playing the Heavy Splatling Remix because as much as I love the Octobrush, uh, I'm not as good as the person that I have brought with me today and quite frankly, how many good Octobrush players are there in the world? I have brought with me, introduce yourself. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Silver, otherwise known as MHF Silver, uh, in the past known as SRL Silver. Um, I've been someone who's known to dabble in the Octobrush since the very original game, and was, well, I used to be pretty well known for it. And uh, so I was invited here to participate and uh, carry Jugga for a couple games. <laughs> yeah, being blunt about it. Uh, well, there's also the fact that you've had input on every single weapon guide that has gone up to this point where you've at least looked at the scripts in some you've suggested things outright, and you also have written several of the map rotations that I've suggested. Yeah, so my name is also the one, yeah, that appears in every single episode. That uh, That's that's me. Yeah. I'm the one. You, uh, you go by many names, but at least Silver is consistent, so you usually know who the hell I'm talking about. <laughs> Yep. Okay, so uh, you're playing the Octobrush for us today, and before we get into the games, I'd like to ask, uh, could you go over your equipment spread, why you pick what you pick, for the fine people watching at home? So, first off, I should probably address the elephant in the room, and that is, my game is in Japanese, <laughs> so when it cuts to my footage, it'll all be in Japanese. Uh, is there a reason for that? Not really. Um, now let's explain my kit. My favorite Octobrush is the vanilla one, in this case, I'm playing the Hero Brush. Um, my build is pretty simple. I run a Peer of Ink Saber sub that I use primarily for auto bomb spam. And then the rest of my kit is swim speed, some dam uh, some bomb defense for burst bomb and ink armor, the things that we, we talk about constantly. And then I'm a big fan of drop roller. I use drop roller for all inkjet weapons. And the Octobrush is, well, a weapon that people love to camp. So getting the ability to roll after your drop is pretty useful for this weapon especially but the my build is in general pretty simple which is nice the octobrush as mentioned during the bio itself is pretty gear independent so it allows octobrush players to have a sort of play style that shines through in just what they pick and well you can definitely tell i'm a fan of the auto bomb with mine that's lovely. I, I like how your equipment covers the weakness as well, because coming out of an inkjet, you'd be pretty helpless with autobomb as your sub weapon, but with drop roller, that isn't really as much of a case. Early on, when drop roller was introduced, I was somebody that had played it, and 
I definitely think it brings value to anything that has an inkjet, but especially something that's short range that can't really fight back to most things that are camping its jump, your best bet is to be able to roll away from it. And it catches people off guard surprisingly often. Uh, I'm playing the Heavy Splatling Remix, an alternate kit for one of my favorite weapons that I didn't get to play the first time around. Um, I've gone with some run speed up, some ink resist up, bomb defense up, and a lot of special charge up because I don't really have a painting sub weapon and I'm going to be wanting to use that Booyah Bomb a lot. So, mine's pretty simple. <laughs> I guess I don't really change around my setup a little bit actually. I don't know if I really need ink saver sub for a point sensor weapon actually. Yeah, I completely changed my setup here. I've gone with a bit more special charge up because I realized that Ink Saver sub was probably not going to help me. The Heavy Splatling Remix isn't significantly helped by a lot of abilities. I guess we have two pretty gear independent weapons, so this is what I've chosen to go with right here. Just so I can get my special even more often. Um, got two subs of quick respawn in here. I'm not expecting to die a lot though, but if I do, it's a good ability. Can help pretty much any weapon in any match. It'll come in handy at least once, I'm sure. So one thing we might notice that in the previous guest appearance that didn't happen is we may run into people that are of higher power mm -hmm. because I'm in this lobby. There's also the potential that we run into Japanese players because I'm on the west coast of America. Yeah. So my ping to Japan is significantly better than yours would be. I didn't know ping was considered that heavily for League. I knew it was for Turf Wars. Um, it is across the board. Uh, ping is one of the bigger factors in deciding the match. Oh, okay. Uh, I knew that it was, like, taken into consideration, though, but I was most heavily- Oh, hey! We got Kobe Arena, so, uh, because we're just jam-packing everything today, we have two brand new maps that we've never seen. 2020. Oof, what an omen of our death. Uh, so, uh, Gobi Arena. Very big area, large center we got. There's a large area around spawn, which is excellent if you play a sprinkler weapon. Just because it's got tons of turf that no one really spends time inking. Oh, jeez. Oh. I noticed the increase in power. Wow. Uh, the is just standing. Okay, whatever. Uh, how about while I'm respawning, you tell us what you're doing? So, I'm currently dead, but my typical play style for Octobrush, especially with the kit I'm running now, is to sort of fish things out with my auto bombs. One of the big advantages to auto bomb that really helps a weapon like the Octobrush is getting knowledge and learning where things are. And that's a big proponent, and why I'm a big fan of it. So most of my playstyle at the start is usually fishing for information, and then I just pick out people from there. Are we still struggling back there? Seems yeah, like kind of. Yeah, they're all on our base. Yeah. I haven't been able to really do much. The Tenebrella is really solid with their recharges. They also aren't spending like any time in kid form. It just makes me feel extra bad about not being able to hit them. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, are they going to pick up the Rainmaker? They do know that they have the entire area painted and they can very easily win at any time, right? Double. I got one kill. At least right. I wasn't totally a worthless slump. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't worry about it. The thing we got to be careful for, though, is they do have a Squid Beacon, so it's a little bit faster for them to get here than it is for us. Certainly, especially in a map like this. Uh, Rainmaker or Gobi Arena is kind of weird, though, because you got those steps in the middle that look like they'd be really vulnerable and make you really obvious, but it really is the optimal way to go, where even if you try to go another way, you make yourself really obvious anyway, so you might as well go the shortest route. <laughs> It's the most obvious, but it is also, like, the definitive one. Which sucks, because it's really easy to defend. Yeah, you got perches on either side of it. Uh, anything like a slosher that doesn't have to be aimed could just attack you from above really easily, too. Pop that. Some... Their Tentabrella has really been infuriating me. Nope. Got caught by the Luna Blaster before I could really make a move there. Oops. There are three down, so this is our opportunity. It doesn't look like they're going to be coming back into our base anytime soon, so I uh, might as well rush it. I'm going to go over this way, Tana Missile, do my dosi do as I call it. <laughs> but it always feels like you just have to like stop and square dance for a second, go around in a circle. Oh. Got all my bullets except one that time. 
Yeah, this is rough. I'm not using my sub weapon nearly enough here, though, so let me start point censoring them. I guess I just don't think to do it in Rainmaker as much, because naturally, as, the, as a longer range weapon, I'm just kind of watching the Rainmaker, trying to snipe them from a distance. Yeah, that is one of the, the difficult parts of the kit for the remix, I feel like, is you have a sub that doesn't really assist you, so there's no real value in you yourself using it. Um, unless you're, like, you know, actively trying to assist the team, at, like, face value, you'd think, oh, why should I use it? It doesn't really do anything for me. I don't need it. Yeah, I've noticed myself not really thinking about it that much in this game, so... You grab it, I will be doing this. Could always be doing the unspoken call and making it so all four of us have communication instead of just two of us. Now, I'm trying... I'm... One of the things I do need to work on, though, is I'm not very great when it comes to inkjets. But I like using inkjet because it's a good distraction. Yeah, it gets, the, it gets people's attention really well. It's also powerful if you can pull it off. It's just difficult to always do that because it's so skill-dependent compared to other specials. Yeah. I know it, it's, but, it sounds kind of bad, though, but a lot of people kind of don't like skill-dependent specials, I feel like, just because they're inconsistent. Yeah, it's very difficult to get like quick value with something that you're like really expected to like hammer down uh, the skill and everything read that right this has been a bit of a rough run yeah it certainly has we're almost at the end of the time living there about to grab it I bet uh got hammered down <laughs> Yeah, that was it. Ah, <laughs> uh, whatever. So you're the X-ray player. Have one. You never lose, right? No kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wish that was the case. Man, imagine, imagine how nice it would be to just never lose. Uh, but the wins wouldn't be as sweet or exciting, you know. But you got 20 kills, man. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly wasn't. Sometimes the. When it's difficult, it's more fun that way. Yeah, yeah, it, defi it definitely works that way. I just realized I didn't name my look. I'm the uh, platform denim cowboy. <laughs> it's a weird name. It's a weird <laughs> costume I have. Right? I have the per so I have the pearlescent kicks with a denim jacket and the cowboy hat. <laughs> so you you play in Japanese largely just because one you can have the game six hours earlier from the eShop, and two you just like how it looks alongside the in-game language, right? I think you've tweeted about this before. Um, it was actually longer than six hours. I actually got access to the game, I think it was 16 hours before oh, launch. Yeah. It, yeah, it, yeah, which did have sense. its drawbacks. Because of the game's matchmaking, I could not get lobbies very quickly. Whoa! I, oh. Oh. oh my god, I died nice. to a suction bomb after all that! <laughs> <laughs> I think I died to the same thing, so don't worry. Oh my god, <laughs> yes, yes, yes! <laughs> <laughs> well, we're making up for the last game. I know that they're lower power, though, but yikes. Ah, oh, yeah, damn. <laughs> this flings like a... Jeez, we opened with 89 points on the board. <laughs> well, we can't get too complacent. The right. one thing about Rainmaker is almost no push is a safe push. Nope. They always come back when you least expect it. Uh, oh. Yeah, they're definitely making a good effort here. Yeah, I also am just kind of feeding a little bit, but that's okay. We've got enough of a lead to work with that it's okay. We definitely stopped that one. We're still a little I safe. I point blank somebody with my heavy splatling there. That was pretty satisfying. Nice. Oh, are they still behind us? I don't really see. Oh, there we go. There's the flings. Up. Oh, he was still behind us. Got him. Nice. Saved us right there. <laughs> Playing goalie. That's why leaving the Rainmaker unattended is not a good playstyle. There's a reason I stayed back, because I didn't know where he was. He Ooh. There. He's dead. You're not. Haha. <laughs> 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 yeah, there's their baller. He's just running for the hills. Dead now. This is definitely not my game, let me tell you that. I'm definitely not gonna get another 20 bomb. Gotcha. Yeah, I've been hanging my back play a lot. Style is always, my playstyle in comparison to a lot of Octobrush players has always been a lot more patient. 
as I just wait things out before I charge in. Well, I, I like a lot that. of Octobrush players, a lot of them nowadays play a very aggro style, which is fine. It's definitely a weapon that you can really, like, play how you want to play. And there's no, like, definitive way to play it. No, I, I like what um, you're doing. I like using the Autobomb to just kind of fish around and, you know, kind of toss it constantly for information. It's a really nice use of the, um, of the, of, uh, Autobomb, where I feel like a lot of weapons just don't really pair with it well if they are really aggro style. Hmm. So I kind of like that. To it's around launch, I actually gravitated a lot toward the Vanilla Octobrush as one of my personal favorite weapons. It is a good one. It's also very unfortunate the Octobrush in general has not fantastic kits. Its kits just sort of suffer from not really addressing any of the problems. The vanilla is the closest thing it gets to that. At least you don't play the Nouveau. I've, I made fun of that one pretty strongly earlier in the video. <laughs> I have, I played all of them as you would expect as someone who actually, who plays the weapon. Um, but it's definitely not my favorite. The vanilla is definitively my favorite. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's definitely the most fun for me too. Ooh, where are they gonna go? Also, the fun thing with um, Auto Bomb is how far you can throw it and how far the activation radius is. You can get some pretty slick shots. Oh, ooh, we're getting pushed back here. The Nautilus got me from the side. I didn't see them there. So I haven't really talked about Walleye Warehouse much. Uh, a lot of people call this the final <laughs> destination of Splatoon. It was my favorite map back in Splatoon 1 because of just how balanced it was. There's a lot of corners you can play with. Uh, you can get up on top of these crates out of spawn. It's not really that easy to get back up on top of them once you have fallen off. And then there's also side areas that I haven't really been doing much as a is just trying to protect the center lane here. But uh, in Rainmaker, there's blocks on the sides allowing you to go up over there. You can kind of see that over there it's painted orange. We have Charger Bug going up it right now. Uh, so that can work. You can also flank the other team by doing that when they don't see it coming if they're focusing too much on the center lane, which is what happened to me with the fling, uh, with the, uh, the whoever got me. Uh, Nautilus, Nautilus got me. Gotcha. You don't. We got two down. The Flingza is still alive, and I am terrified of that. Bomb rushing. Or no, they're not bomb rushing. They just had two splat bombs at the same time. Flingza is back there. We're going to just toss that. Gotcha. It should be respawning back in any second, so we can score some last second points. Might be able to get it. Oh. Uh, not quite. Ah. Like, I got, like, three kills on my rush in, though. If we can just grab the Rainmaker one more time, that is it, which yep. right now we do. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, I'll talk about these maps in greater detail at a later time, though, but I really wanted to have you showcase the weapon, just tell us why you're doing what you're doing and all that, and it came out, I think it came out pretty nicely. Yeah, it def that one was definitely not a good one for me, uh, but... <clears throat> we still took it. I mean, we were doing really well early game and late game. Yeah, the start for me was not fantastic. We turned it around, though. Well, that is uh, uh, that is both of the maps that we were set here to play today. Those are pretty lengthy matches. I think that was pretty good. Um, would yeah. you like to plug anything that you do? I know that you do some meta-analysis videos, especially for the Octobrush, actually, back in the day. Yeah, so I do my own YouTube videos. Um, in fact, Chuggo was in one of my videos back at the launch of Splatoon 2. And a bit of a fun fact for people that watched that video, maybe that there might be some crossover here. We were actually planning this series before that video was even made. Yeah. So, and that one was made around launch. Yeah, it, uh, it just took that long for it to come out because, uh, quite frankly, the scope of this thing was utterly massive and I didn't realize a lot of things like how much bigger of a game this was than the first one. Uh, you know, the optimal way to develop something like this alongside a game that is releasing updates, and also just the fact that I didn't know that they would do another Splatoon game in the same console generation, so I thought, oh, I have time until they announced the Switch 2. <laughs> yeah, it's it's definitely had a bunch of roadblocks. In fact, it's most of the roadblocks were content related. Anytime they would adjust something or, or announce a balance patch, that was enough to postpone things by months. Yeah, it was. That, that kept happening where they're like, whoops, fooled you. They're, we're not done with updates yet. Eventually, I realized I couldn't wait for the final updates because Splatoon 3 has not killed updates to this game. I think in the last patch notes, they said that they will be doing another patch down the road. 
Yeah, they've always said that, but it's also been quite some time since they've done something. But we we decided it was probably better to just get it started because most of the recent patches have been very minor changes that realistically don't impact the bios in any meaningful way. Exactly. It's stuff like plus 10 to your special charge or this weapon paints the ground 4% worse than it used to. And those sorts of things, yes, while they do affect performance and they might affect like a tier list placement in some subtle way down the road, they're not going to impact the way that you play the weapon, which is what we're teaching you. Exactly. Yeah. So anyway, thank you so much for joining me and thank you so much for sticking by me all these years, helping me plan this out, all those things. I appreciate it so much more than I think even you know, so thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun to help out and do this. This was something I was super excited to have finally come out. Mm -hmm. It's been almost five years in the making, so... Yeah. All right, well, um, I guess we'll end it there. Uh, thank you so much, and... Uh, frick, what's the next weapon? I knew it a second ago. Uh, Octobrush. Okay, I got it. All right, so now, next time on Splatoon 2, we are covering a bizarre mix of damage and painting. Yeah, I'm not kidding. See you guys then. One day, Callie was awakened by a call on her cell phone. It was her manager. The recording session she had scheduled for the day had been delayed to accommodate a different performer. Callie found herself a bit thrown off by this unexpected break, but was determined to make the most of it. Looking around the apartment, she saw no sign of Marie, which was odd. She was sure Marie had the day off as well. It was just past eight in the morning, too early for Marie to have gone shopping. Callie decided to get dressed and head out in search of her roommate. Now that she thought about it, Marie had seemed a bit down lately. There was something on her mind she couldn't stop thinking about. Maybe she was just tired from working too hard. Or maybe something had happened to upset her. But worrying about her all day won't fix anything, Callie thought. Work had barely given her time to breathe lately. She'd been feeling a bit lost at sea herself. She made up her mind to find Marie and invite her out for a day of much needed relaxation. Callie found Marie at a cafe with Krusty Sean. They were seated at a table, chatting away. Perhaps it was because their hometowns were so close to one another that Callie and Marie both found Sean so easy to talk to. Marie had been a bit shy when they had first come to the city, after all. Callie couldn't remember the last time she'd seen Marie talking so cheerfully with anyone besides her. And she didn't want to spoil their fun. She decided to head back to the apartment, alone. Callie was making breakfast when Marie came home. Marie looked a bit surprised to see Callie up and about, but greeted her friend in stride. Morning. Morning. Same old Marie, thought Callie. While they ate, Callie invited Marie to go shopping, and she gladly accepted.